All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this online seminar organized by the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research. My name is Samuli Kangaslampi. I'm a psychologist and postdoctoral researcher, and I'll be hosting tonight's webinar here. Uh, yeah, tonight we're very happy to have with us um, Dr. Sandeep Nayak, who is a medical doctor and psychiatrist by background but also a researcher on all things psychedelic and has published widely on different aspects of, of research on psychedelics, including on, on um, clinical trials, has um, been part of conducting several clinical trials on, on psilocybin especially, has also published on other topics, um, belief changes associated with, with psychedelics, uh, and... Um, psychotherapeutic issues, which um, he will be talking about today. He's now assistant professor at the um, Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. Very happy to have you with us tonight, Sandeep. Looking forward to hearing you, hearing what you have to say about, about your topic, which tonight is, to what extent is psychedelic existed therapy, just psychotherapy. So go ahead, Sandeep. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Smully, and thank you all for the invitation. I'm very happy to be talking to you all. And so, yes, I am a researcher, but I also am a clinician, and I'm going to be talking about this kind of in a simultaneous way about, like, I, I treat people with this modality, and that does inform um, some of my talk. So to what extent is psychedelic assisted therapy psychotherapy? And this is, a, I think, a timely and, and, and quite controversial topic. So first off, let me just say that I, I do think that psychedelic therapy is a kind of psychotherapy. And there are a couple of reasons for this. I'll, I'll get in, into detail. And I, I will define psychotherapy later. But let me just say a bit about like what actually happens in psychedelic therapy trials so that we're all on the same page. So um, first off, they, they are delivered in a fairly stereotyped way using what you might call the psychedelic therapy model. And in this model, which is pretty much how the majority of trials are done all around the world, the patient will spend hours uh, cumulatively with, with therapists beforehand, usually to building rapport, learning the effects of the psychedelic, getting some coaching on how to handle it. Um, and the the purpose of the dosing day is to, to create like this very you know singular uh meaningful experience and, and during that day the patient generally lies down wearing eye shades listening to music and is coached and encouraged to adopt an attitude of experiential acceptance curiosity uh to trust let go and be open and and this is all a model that was invented in the 60s that we use um, essentially with minimal change to this day. It is very much not guided psychotherapy. Um, people are not engaging any, anything that looks like normal um, talk psychotherapy with, with uh, psilocybin, for example. Um, and yeah, so that's the model. I guess I'll say also that this is just one of many different surviving models. Uh, from an era where many different other types of ways of using psychedelics were were uh, prevalent. Um, but th this is the model that has sort of taken over the world. So, yeah. And the, two of the points that I think are relevant to this idea that psychedelic therapy is psychotherapy is that one, I think it is quite likely that the subjective effects themselves are, are causally therapeutic which we'll discuss. And I, I also think that you could argue that the psychological support that I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the pre-drug prep sessions, the post-drug integration sessions are arguably de facto psychotherapy. So we'll talk more about that. But if this is true, if psychedelic therapy is psychotherapy, this is a problem. This is a problem for regulators who regulate drugs, but not psychotherapy. This is a problem financially because the uh, main cost of this intervention is the very substantial labor of the therapists. There's a recent cost effectiveness analysis that showed that even if psilocybin is uh, more than twice as effective as standard treatments in inducing remission, uh, it is still not cost effective given the amount of labor hours that are required. 
And it's also a problem inferentially. Um, the question of how do you know the drug actually works and not the psychotherapy? It violates the uh, typical practices around drug trials where you try to isolate the effect of the drug independent of the context in which it's given. And there's a very similar, slightly different but related debate, which is can you get therapeutic effects of psychedelics without the subjective effects? So here I'm showing you the titles of these two dueling opinion pieces. Subjective effects are necessary. Subjective effects may not be necessary. And I, I actually do think it's quite possible that you could get um, subjective effects of psychedelics uh, without the profound, sorry, therapeutic effects without the profound subjective effects. Um, and there's, there's many reasons to think this might be a promising avenue uh, to look at, for example, some of the therapeutic effects that occur in animals or the rapidity of therapeutic effects. There, there's, there's probably more going on than, than simply um, psychotherapeutic effects. But this is a topic of active research and debate. And I think that both camps would argue that, for example, uh, psilocybin can, could cause treatment effects, therapeutic effects, via at least two pathways, one which includes subjective effects as, as a part of the causal chain and one which does not. And these are both um, drug effects in a sense, right? They're caused by psilocybin, um, but I, I think this is a, a useful distinction. And both camps would agree that these, these two pathways are probably happening. It's more a question of what's the, the relative strength. So the psilocybin therapeutic effects that are mediated by subjective effects, I think could fairly be called psychotherapeutic. These you could call um, direct drug effects. And note that this, this pathway in red here, this is typically what you're interested in a drug trial. This is what our clinical trial methodology is really best suited for detecting, um, even though these are both drug effects. So we'll unpack the implication to this a bit later. And I wanna present a bit the counter argument. So this is a recent um, opinion piece review article by a couple of folks from Compass. This is the largest um, entity that's pushing forward psilocybin therapy. And the title is called Must Psilocybin Always Assist Psychotherapy? So these bullet points are kind of their, the thesis of their argument. So one is that they state that psilocybin therapy is, is not psychotherapy. Uh, in part because during the drug effects, you really cannot do anything that looks like traditional psychotherapy. And that's, that's true. Another point that they make is that the psychological support that is typically used is generic. Um, it's non-directive, it's relationship-centered, um, and that that sort of generic uh, non-directive uh, psychological support has not been shown to be effective for conditions without um, psilocybin and a third point, I'm just kind of listing their points. I don't uh, actually agree with uh, several of these, is that the psychological support is there for safety, not efficacy. Um, and I'll just actually read a quote that they say about this. So the psychological support uh, is primarily directed to safety, specifically the preparation and safeguarding of vulnerable people who are submitted to a disorienting experience. Such safety creates optimal conditions for patients to be immersed in the psychedelic experience. Um, so they're, they're arguing that the safety is somehow important for immersion into an experience, which it doesn't really make a lot of sense as a safety argument, but we can, I'm just kind of putting these out there for now and we'll discuss them later. Um, and they also argue that it's not at all clear that the integration, the post drug, um, psychological support meetings are at all necessary for therapeutic effects because the effects are apparent the, the day after treatment. So these are, these are quite powerful counter arguments for why maybe psychedelic therapy is not psychotherapy. Um, but we will discuss these. And the, the shadow kind of, kind of cast over all of this is that we're talking about drugs that are now quite far along the regulatory approval pathway. Um, and drug regulators really are not typically tasked with assessing psychotherapy. So there, there is also a bit of a financial incentive to present psychedelic therapy as somehow not involving um, psychotherapy. 
So I said I would define psychotherapy. Um, and my, my basic point here is I think if you understand a bit the sorts of things that tend to work in psychotherapy, you will see that they are at play in psychedelic therapy. So we'll, we'll discuss this idea of the common factors of psychotherapy. And it's this relatively well-validated notion that it is the bulk of a psychotherapy, the bulk of a psychotherapy's therapeutic effects are shared across different psychotherapies. And that it is the shared features of different psychotherapies that are most therapeutically active, not their specific or differentiating ones. So in other words, CBT, psychodynamic therapy, they may be doing very different things, but it's actually what they share in common that's most therapeutically active, the relationship, the alliance, goal consensus and elaboration, development of emotional skills, et cetera. Um, and a related point is that there are actually very few instances of one bona fide psychotherapy that it's actually beating another in head to head studies. So all bona fide psychotherapies, so this, um, this theory goes, contain these common factors, but also um, an intervention that contains all the common factors is a psychotherapy. So that, this is called the, the dodo bird verdict. Uh, here's the dodo from Alice in Wonderland who says uh, something like, everybody has won and all shall have prizes. This is used to discuss this idea that different psychotherapies um, tend to perform equivalently when tested head to head. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about like the specific empirical underpinnings of this. There are several different systems. Um, I'll talk a bit about Jerome Frank's one and, and Wampold's, but there's also Orlinsky's and Las Gravas and um, th they all actually pretty much say the same thing. Um, in, the, in the big picture. So Jerome Frank, I guess I'm partial to him because he uh, was at Hopkins for a while and trained some of my mentors, but he wrote this fantastic book, Persuasion Healing, viewed psychotherapy as being a salve for demoralization, it essentially worked via, via, um, via meaning. So it, its main goal was to correct pathogenic meanings that patients attribute to, to feelings and events in their lives. And these were some of the common factors that he identified. According to Frank, all psychotherapies involve an emotionally charged and fighting relationship with an expert who is believed to have jurisdiction over psychological healing. They have a healing setting. They have a rationale, conceptual scheme, or myth that is, uh, provides some understanding of the patient's problem, uh, and as, as well as a way of understanding how that problem can be improved that is, that is believable by both the therapist and the patient and also a ritual that requires the performance of both the patient and the therapist. Um, and all psychotherapies, according to Frank, should also allow for corrective emotional experiences, emo like learning and building new skills and rescripting pathogenic meaning. And I, I think any psychedelic therapy trial in the world would satisfy these criteria. A bit more on the empirical support. So, on the Dodo Bird verdict, there's uh, now a couple of meta-analyses that compare active psychotherapies head-to-head -head and find pretty minimal difference in their performance. Also, there are these um, dismantling studies, studies which take the putative active ingredient of psychotherapy and remove it. Um, and, and these studies have not actually found with very convincing evidence that psychotherapy the active ingredient is actually doing the, the bulk of the work. Another related point, um, adherence to a studied therapy and demonstrated competence in performing it should be related to the treatment outcome. If the specific ingredients of the therapy are explaining the bulk of the benefit and adherence and, and, and competence actually do not um, correlate all that well with patient outcomes. And in fact, there's some evidence that rigid adherence to a protocol can attenuate um, some of the effects of psychotherapy in clinical trials. This is just another study showing the same thing. Adherence is not clearly associated with therapeutic outcomes. Adherence to a uh, manualized therapy. Okay, so Wampold's model. And again, I'll, I'll just say up front, this is kind of all the same stuff. So he talked about the relationship expectations. So this is an important point when we, we talk about the um, clinical trial methodology, uh, so expectancy effects, as well as the specific ingredients that are unique to individual therapies. So 
I won't go into detail on all of these. I just want to uh, kind of quickly show you, but um, relationship, the therapeutic relationship is one of the strongest common factors. One portion of this is the therapeutic alliance, and we'll see this again and again, but it's essentially the agreement between therapist and patient on the purpose and tasks of therapy. It's not necessarily what you would typically call like a um, like an affective relationship. And this is one of the strongest um, common factors that it recurs again and again and again. And it is um, what, one of the marks of like a very good psychotherapist is that they're able to create a therapeutic alliance with a range of different types of people. There's also the relationship itself, the interpersonal affective bond, um, which you can decompose into different elements. And there's other relational common factors as well. Um, and I won't get into all of those, but one thing that's worth um, oh yeah, I have this here. But one thing that's worth mentioning is that like the relationship supports all of the other elements of psychotherapy. So, you know, one example is that strong rapport may be necessary for a patient to absorb a new or difficult interpretation and generally successful psychotherapy may import the sense of being understood and valued. This is true with psychotherapy in general, psychedelic therapy in particular. Um, and yeah, the, the, expectancy effects as a common factor. So arguably all psychotherapy involves and manipulates expectation. And these are precisely what you try to minimize or what are viewed as extraneous when you, when you think about traditional drug trials. So it's the expectancy effect, which it subsumes the placebo effect in part, but also the meaning making that occurs and then, and then there's like the specific ingredients, which includes like health promoting behaviors, emotional skills. All right. I'm not going to talk about the other um, schools of common factors, but th they, they broadly get at similar ideas. So psychedelics, I argue, not only include the common factors, but may even enhance them, um, tend to enhance the sense of meaning. These are highly meaningful experiences when administered in a therapeutic context, often among the most meaningful of people's lives. Um, sense of connection uh, is, a, is a theme, heightened interpersonal connection. Suggestibility, this gets talked about a lot. There's actually not great evidence that this is the case, but it's, it's very plausible. Um, but enhanced suggestibility with psychedelics um, could, in theory, play into a broader range of um, interpretations being plausible. And then there's this idea that perhaps psychedelics are increasing plasticity, which might make any changes that are, occur in the post-drug period like more durable. Um, they may enhance the relationship. I can talk about like specific cases too that demonstrate some of these points if we have time later. But um, psychedelic therapy experiences tend to produce psychological insight. They can create increased mindfulness and acceptance, even if these aren't being directly trained, people often have a sense of self-mastery. Um, there's a sense that emotional skills are being developed. And it, it's, it's a very interpersonally, uh, inter, inter, interpersonally intense and intimate uh, endeavor. And so it's quite plausible that it heightens the relationship. And there's some data on that as well. Uh, I think I've sort of said this, but Given what we know about psychotherapy, it would be stunning if an experience that was among the most memorable and meaningful of one's life was interpersonally embedded, relational, produces highly psychologically insightful experiences, emotionally cathartic, and, and during, in which people learn and practice emotional skills. It would be stunning if that was not psychotherapeutic, if that was pure, purely epiphenomenal or some underlying drug process. Okay, so I'll just give a couple of empirical examples that um, point at this idea that maybe psychedelic therapy is acting psychotherapeutically. So this is a trial from Imperial where they tested two doses of psilocybin versus the SSRI, escitalopram for major depressive disorder. They found that mental health improvements in the psilocybin, of course, both groups get better um, to some extent, but mental health improvements were mediated by decreased experiential avoidance in the psilocybin group, not escitalopram, and acute subjective effects measures predicted reduced experiential avoidance. So this idea that perhaps there is some process going on that is psychotherapeutic and is different from what occurs in conventional drug treatment. This is, what is this? Right, this is from the same study actually, 
Um, so therapeutic alliance, this is one of the strongest common factors, predicted emotional breakthrough. So this is a measure of the acute subjective experience, predicted emo emotional breakthrough and mystical experience. And people get two doses of psilocybin. So emotional breakthrough in the first session predicted enhanced therapeutic alliance before the second. And then that also, again, predicted um, greater mystical experience, which predicted improved depression. So you have this chain of like the therapeutic alliance predicts the effects and the effects predict the outcomes, but then the therapeutic alliance and the effects and the outcomes predict that the, the uh, they, they alter the therapeutic relationship. And th this is what you see in psychotherapy. It's not what you see in, in, in typical drug trials. I'm going to, I really like Max Wolf's work on this a lot. I'm going to just read um, this quote in its entirety, but this is from a great paper, Learning to Let Go. It's basically an example of how might the psychedelic experience as, as, it, as it occurs in clinical trials be somehow training um, emotional skills that, that might be sort of that, that can be understood in like more prosaic or normal terms. Uh, and I agree with all this. So avoidance and acceptance are often central themes of psychedelic therapy. Patients commonly report episodes of struggle, intense aversion, often characterized by extreme fear and panic. Uh, this is true, even though they know that they are physically safe and that this is a temperate transitory experience. Attempts to exert control over challenging experiences, i.e. experiential avoidance, typically fail. Instead, patients frequently report the experience only and often immediately assumed a more positive character when they eventually surrendered or let go, which remember they're being coached or trained how to do, um, and when they adopted an accepting attitude. The associated experience of emotional breakthrough is commonly described as insightful and rewarding and has been proposed to be a key component of so. So a, a common theme, and I'm not sure there's a ton of empirical work on it, but just this is what you see when you deal with these patients a lot is that they may have a difficult experience that invites them to cope with it in their customary way, the way that they usually do. And then it, it doesn't work. And it, it's often a, a form of avoidance and it just doesn't work in the psychedelic therapy context. And there's a different form of engaging with it that is often more like accepting um, that, that actually does work. It, the avoidance tends to be punished. Acceptance tends to be rewarded um, for this really curious reason. Um, and that, that, that tends to train a, a specific type of skill that can generalize after the experience. People will apply it to their life. And th there's like a very clear analogy here, I think, with exposure therapy, which patients will, who've had it will often spontaneously make. And, and by the way, I should say too, this is all true without us, like, we're not framing this as exposure therapy. We're not telling people, we're, not, we're often not using specific, um, you know, theory laden psychotherapeutic tools, but this is just what happens. All right, so this, I've already shown you this slide. This is back to this argument that psilocybin therapy is not really psychotherapy. It's best understood as a direct drug effect. So, I, I see a lot of problems with this argument. Um, so one is that I think it fails to grapple with the fact that psychedelic therapy probably acts psychotherapeutically. Um, in other words, that even the drug experience itself, which is caused by a drug, is probably acting psychotherapeutically. And that the problems that come from dealing with, with a psychotherapy methodologically, inferentially, uh, cannot be just relegated to the adjunctive psychological support, the, the, the pre-drug and the post-drug meetings. Um, this is sort of scapegoating the problem. But two, uh, the idea that traditional psychotherapeutic processes cannot be occurring in the drug session because it doesn't look like traditional psychotherapy because people are lying down having an internal experience. There's no reason um, to make that assumption. And I, I think it's really a, a bit of a bait and switch to claim that because people are not performing traditional, typical psychotherapy under drug effects, um, and because psychological support is not a defined evidence-based psychotherapy, 
that the therapeutic processes that are occurring are not psychotherapy. I, I think that's um, not, not correct. It's a very narrow understanding of what psychotherapy is and can be, and the processes that occur both in psychotherapy and in psychedelic therapy. Um, and, and yeah, and the fact that psychedelic therapy trials generally do not use an evidence-based psychotherapy does not negate the fact that the intervention can act psychotherapeutically. So this point they make that, you know, you have immediate therapeutic effect at the bottom. So it's not clear that this integration matters. It's a very astute point. Um, but I, I would predict that uh, integration versus no integration this integration just means like the post-drug psychological support meetings. I think that that would predict um, differences in durability of therapeutic effects. And there is already some evidence for this. Um, this is like in a healthy, it was not like a clinical study, but it was like um, a healthy study, healthy participant study with spiritual practice where one group got low support, one group got high and in the low support group, 20% were meditating daily at six month follow up compared to 64%. Um, okay, that work still needs to be done though. That's, that's pretty speculative, I think. So if psilocybin therapy indeed acts psychotherapeutically, that means that the mechanisms that apply to psychotherapy also apply to psilocybin therapy. And the methodological problems that apply to psychotherapy also apply to psilocybin therapy. I, I should say, like I work with psilocybin, I don't work with MDMA, I don't work with ketamine. So my, my talk is really geared towards psilocybin. Um, there are probably some relevant differences with MDMA that I am not, um, I, I, I have not gotten into and, and don't intend to, but we can talk about those in questions if that's of interest. Um, but for example, this means that we should attend to the therapeutic relationship, the therapeutic alliance, generally treat it as a psychotherapeutic situation. I think that even a pared down minimalistic version of psychedelic therapy is likely to act psychotherapeutically, and we can ignore the lessons of this at our peril. Um, but we also need to take seriously the methodological difficulties of studying a psychother psychotherapy. Um, and a, a related point that I disagree with. So this is from colleagues who I really respect and um, like a lot. But this is a paper called Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, Cognitive Behavioral Approaches as Default. And it's, I think it's easy to caricature their arguments, but um, there's definite value to it. But uh, anyway, I'll just explain what I'm saying. The basic point I think is that if you are, and this is like, like widely shared by clinical trial methodologists, I think is that if you're studying, if this intervention is psychotherapeutic, then you should, and you're saying it's a very important part, then you should use an evidence-based psychotherapy. And again, I think that's a quite a narrow understanding of psychotherapy. And again, even without psychedelics, we, we don't have very clear and consistent, consistent evidence that one psychotherapy clearly outperforms another um, and you'd have this common factors idea, but, but second, there's not good reason to think that cramming together an existing modality with psychedelics is the best way forward that, that you can extrapolate, um, non-psychedelic evidence base to psychedelic evidence base. I, I do think that something like this is very important for minimizing therapist degrees of freedom. So people who are attracted to psychedelic therapy work tend to be, or yeah, tend to be, can be a bit odd and have some unusual ideas and um, sometimes are drawn to uh, ideas about how to do psychotherapy that are, that are like not acceptable in conventional psychotherapy. And that, that can lead to abuses that can lead to just bad practices. And I'm talking about things like poor boundaries. I'm talking about things related to touch. Um, I'm talking about things related to vulnerable patients. So I do think there's great value um, in, in standardizing more for preventing harms than for enhancing efficacy. And again, I think that our current model of psilocybin therapy uses a fairly non-directive approach that is not that, that theoretically laden. And yet I still argue that that is psychotherapy. 
but I, I, I contradict myself. I, I, I do think it's worth studying um, clearly defined existing psychotherapies and pairing them with psilocybin, especially as you're getting into, um, I don't know, like difficult to treat conditions where clinical understanding is like quite important. Thinking PTSD, for example. So uh, I said I wouldn't do this, I guess, but I'm going to, I see a question in the chat. I'll just get into it. What kind of ethical dilemmas do you see in researching effects of psychedelic assisted therapy without the psychotherapy part? For instance, comparing a group that receives pre and post drug support to a group that doesn't. Um, so yeah, there is a, this is a fantastic question and it's a, it's a common question, especially from like, well, so there's this idea that like, if you're saying that this is so important, uh, where's the evidence? Like, where's the empirical support that you need all this psychological support? Um, and there is an assumption that it is not going to be safe or effective to study, for example, psilocybin therapy without this wrapper of intensive psychological support. And I, I think that's true. I think that's likely to be true. However, strictly speaking, we have not shown that, right? Um, there, there were three studies in the 50s. They were all in the 50s that administered uh, LSD. LSD to patients in clinical trials where they had like pretty minimal psychological support. You can't really extrapolate them to the present day because they didn't, none of them really used um, one. They didn't really describe what they were doing that well and the safety piece. They didn't, it was insufficient reporting, but also the psychological support that they use looks very different from what we would do now. Um, they were basically doing talk psychotherapy while people were on large doses of LSD, which is really not at all what we do. So I think that, um, it should be studied. I have my personal suspicions about what it's going to show, but intuitions are often wrong. And the main risk is causing suffering to patients, uh, because of the, like an overwhelming experience. And I think that risk can be mitigated if you use a very low threshold to abort the experience with a drug like risperidone. Um, so I think it's important to study. Uh, I think it's worth studying. I think that there are ethical risks that can be managed. I personally would not want to run that study and I would not want a family member to be in that study um, because of my own intuitions about but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about this, I think, from two different angles. I think it should be studied, and I think the ethical uh, risks can be managed, though. And it, it's worthwhile. Thank you for the question. Control conditions. So if it's a psychotherapy, what does that, what does that mean? So let's go back to our, um, our causal diagram. So psilocybin, you can see the mouse, causes treatment effects, possibly through this direct drug pathway possibly through the subjective effects pathway that might look where, where this stuff might be more like conventional psychotherapy, albeit dramatic. And, um, but, but in a, in a typical drug trial, you want to control for what you think the active ingredients of your intervention are. So in this case, we're saying it's red and then you want to, um, sorry, you want to control for the extraneous stuff that it's not. So the black stuff, so typically for a drug trial, people have these expectations like, oh, this drug is going to make me so much happier and better and not depressed. And if people can figure out what they got, that'll unleash these expectations, which can cause therapeutic effects that are separate from the, uh, what you think the active ingredients are. So let's just accept this premise for a moment. Um, and let's also just accept that these are the active ingredients. Oops. So these are the things you want to control for. Now, we can. It, it's very important to have this question in your mind, control for what? Because the kinds of control conditions that are talked about often like don't engage with this question, like what are we trying to control for? So let's just look at some of the things that have been suggested. So here's one. Um, 
you have a control that allows this direct drug pathway, but does not cause subjective effects. And this is the so-called non-psychoactive psychedelic. This is stuff that David Olson is chemist, brilliant chemist is, is making to try to see if you can get the dr therapeutic drug effects of psychedelics without the subjective effects. Another way of doing this is administering psychedelics to people under anesthesia. Um, and it's a fantastic idea and I think it's worth studying. However, if this subjective effects pathway is a big portion of the effects, you're, you're not actually, uh, your control condition is not adequately assessing for that. It would be good to know though, like what, what is the magnitude of this? Yeah, sorry, I said that. Here's another uh, control condition. So psilocybin or psychedelic causes the direct drug effects. It causes the subjective effects, but it, those subjective effects do not lead people to know what drug they got, does not lead people to, uh, not lead to any therapeutic effects. And examples of this are midazolam. This is a benzodiazepine amnesia. So there's a study that's ongoing in University of Wisconsin where people are given uh, doses of benzos. Sometime, I think, during the psilocybin experience in order to induce amnesia. Um, it's not working, is my understanding. It's not, it's not working that well. And, but we are inadvertently running this in a study of patients with Alzheimer's disease with um, comorbid major depressive disorder. So these patients largely cannot remember their experiences. It's too early to say like what, what the data on that show. But again, if, if you think that psychedelic therapy is acting via psychotherapeutic mechanisms, you are actually controlling out a lot of your effects. That's so unclear that this is a, a very useful um, control condition for the, the entire drug effect. And finally, you have what, the, uh, what, what, what most drug trials try to do. You, you get all of your red but you, you attempt to block, um, you know, you, you attempt to blind it, right? Placebo controlled trials, which in theory can block the ex expectations. And the, uh, there's a lot of criticism about this because people say correctly that you cannot really blind a high dose psilocybin experience and psilocybin versus placebo 90 plus percent of people are going to be able to know what they got. And that is true. Like when blind is assessed uh, in placebo controlled trials, the blinding is very poor. However, um, I think there's another solution to this, which is not, um, you know, getting everybody to think that they like, fit, like, oh, maybe I got placebo, maybe you got psilocybin. I think, I think that the only real way you can preserve this um, trial design is to just get everyone to think that they got the active drug. And this is the compass trial. And this is about as good as it gets when it comes to blinding. Um, I, I don't think that you can really do much better than this, uh, even though they didn't assess blinding, they should. But in this trial, people got 25 milligrams of psilocybin, which is a high dose, one milligram of psilocybin, which is that's nothing that that's a placebo it probably doesn't even produce any subjective effects, but, but most importantly, they got 10 milligrams and that is a dose that would produce substantial, um, psychoactive effects. It, it clearly was not enough to be therapeutic. And so you do see that there is some separation with the 10 milligram condition in green from, excuse me, placebo one milligram, but it's not you still see a dose response effect. Um, and I, I think that's about as good as you can do when it comes to blinded trials. And we should maybe all, all start doing this um, using like active doses that are subtherapeutic, especially if you include some form of deception, like people don't know that they're going to get a, um, well, I don't know. We can talk more about that in questions if people are interested. Okay, so point of blinding is to prevent unleashing expectancy effects. 
However, I've also said that expectancy is probably a mechanism of psychotherapy. It's one of the common factors. Um, and then so there are, of course, of course, real world designs that test the effectiveness of the entire package that treats all of this as active ingredients. Um, and this cartoon causal diagram I'm using, it's, it's, in, in the real life, it's probably much more complicated. Um, so there is a motivation to test real world designs. And I'll just give one example of conditions under which I think you can make reasonable causal inferences about treatment effects with designs that are unblinded. Um, so changing gears, let's just look at non-psychedelic. Here's what we know about the efficacy of short-term interventions to, to stop smoking. So these are all interventions that they, you know, they last for a period of a few weeks or, or so, then they're stopped. And then you follow up in long-term uh, follow-up. So the y-axis is percent abstinent in percent abstinent from tobacco. And the x-axis is various long-term follow-up time points. And I'm showing you meta-analyses of bupropion versus placebo. These are all approved treatments for smoking cessation. Varenicline versus different regimes of nicotine, uh, nicotine patch versus placebo. So the, the gist is that at, at least in terms of time-limited interventions, long-term follow-up, none of these surpass the 40% bar. Um, so there's a ceiling. There's an upper bound. And to me, it seems quite implausible that on the basis of expectancy or placebo effects alone, you could surpass this in long-term follow-up. So that, that, that's sort of nice conditions to, to do an unblinded study. And so this is a study that's ongoing at Hopkins. I believe um, the final participant has been dosed, but data has not been fully collected, where uh, it's open label. It's a trial of psilocybin versus nicotine patch for smoking cessation. So everybody gets CBT for smoking cessation for a month. They are then randomized to a unblinded single dose of, it's like 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms, I think. So it's a, it's a high dose. The psilocybin versus nicotine patch. And both groups continue to get like quite substantial psychological support. Um, and then week 13, the intervention is done. There is no further... Uh, therapeutic intervention and people are followed up at three, six, and 12 months. And there's results. Um, on the left, this is what I've already shown you. On the right, already shown you. And this is the um, results from psilocybin versus nicotine patch. So first thing I'll draw your attention to is that the Nicotine patch group is actually doing about as well as nicotine patch does. And in fact, if you look at the time point, it's actually slightly better. So this gives some confidence that this is a fair comparison. We're, we're comparing psilocybin to something real. But the psilocybin group is just doing, it, it far outstrips um, the ceiling effect, which even though this is an unblinded design, I think tells us we, we, we can make meaningful causal inference from this. Um, and this is a drug trial, but this is, I think, more similar to, it, it just more honestly acknowledges that we have blinding problems that are difficult to solve. So we do need to use different methods. And this is the only example of this that I am aware of in psychedelic therapy trials, but there are other ways that you could test this. There are other kind of real world effectiveness designs that you could do for a variety of other conditions. The, the specifics would have to be different, um, but but yeah, I, I, th I think there's more room for, um, for creative trial design. So that, that's all my slides. Um, so I can end there. We can transition to talking. But thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure to, to speak with you all. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for this, this um, fascinating talk on, on um, whether psychotherapy is, is just psychotherapy and also for your ideas on these research design issues and blinding and even some novel data right there so yeah um please um do post your questions and and comments um people especially in finland often take a while to warm up and, and come up with their questions but um i'm sure there will be quite a few once people get going right. um yes we do already have one question here so from an anonymous right. participant asking about deception uh, about 
when talking about active but still subtherapeutic doses. So I also wanted to actually ask about this. What are your do you have any experiences of designs involving deception or or ideas about whether they work and are they ethical and and all that? Uh yes. Let me share my screen again. So I'll go back to the example that I was thinking of when I said that, which is a design like this, where everybody gets psilocybin and you either get one milligram, 10 milligrams or 25 milligrams. And one of the problems in terms of blinding um, integrity for design like this is that, well, maybe people know exactly they're going to get a minuscule dose or a moderate dose or a high dose. And so one way that you could try to address that is through deception, right? You deceive people as to how many arms there are. So maybe instead they are told that they're going to get a low dose or a moderate to high dose. You really only include them into two conditions. I personally am not very comfortable with deception. Um, so I think it does solve a methodological problem. I'm not sure if I personally would want to run a trial that does that. However, I, I think that this type of thing is not generally seen to be ethically very problematic. And there would be some um, utility for, I think, enhancing blinding. Um, and I, I, I would be very curious to talk to people who've worked on this trial. I wonder about... Some, pe some people who get 25 milligrams have pretty mild experiences and some people who get lower um, doses get have pretty profound experiences. So there, there is like this variability in drug effect that plausibly could cause these to overlap. That's what I meant. Um, if that's not clear, I'm happy to say more though. Yeah, maybe to follow up a little bit on this in some instances some sort of research designs outside psychedelics you could take deception you know, further um uh, uh in terms of participants not exactly knowing what's going to happen or what was being given to some do you think that in the case of psilocybin it's essential that the the participants know what to expect and um so that they have to have a fairly realistic idea of what's going to happen and what drug they're going to be given and so on so that no, you do have to tell them in any, any way that it will be psilocybin and will have these effects. For, I, I sort of see there being different ethical considerations for clinical or, or like treating patients versus healthy participants. So for patients, I would feel uncomfortable doing a trial where people do not know that they're going to get psilocybin or could get psilocybin. For healthy participants, I'm actually quite comfortable with that, especially if they're not psychedelic naive. Uh, and when we're, we're like running a trial, there's a trial at Hopkins where people, as part of the consent, are given a list of 38 different drugs that they could get. And it includes, I mean, everything you can imagine. And they end up getting psilocybin or dextromethorphan. And there's another version where they get dextromethorphan or midazolam. And these are people who are experienced in a variety of drugs. I think that's completely ethically acceptable. Right. Another question from anonymous attendees on uh, the concept of pathogenic meaning that was mentioned in one of the slides. Could you elaborate on that? Not sure where it was there. Yeah, this is a Jerome Frank kind of concept where um, basically people have certain notions about their life. Like I'm a bad person. Everything I do is doomed to fail. I am worthless because I am not loved. Uh, like all of these different ways that people might be assaulted by meaning. Um, and, and the idea of it being pathogenic is that not only does it cause suffering, but it also prevents the person from um, like living their life in a way that could get them out of it. And so this is something that like, I think happens with psychedelic therapy like people have these highly meaningful experiences that that will often but not always but often lead to a change in the sense of some aspect the meaning or the meaningfulness of some aspect of their life maybe they're dealing with a divorce and they feel like a failure because this relationship failed my ex-wife hates me blah 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 um i can't but but 
repairing that pathogenic meaning would be trying to find some alternate meaning that could allow for moving forward in life and finding value and whatnot. Yeah. Another question is about the idea of evidence-based psychotherapy. Could you talk about that? How much evidence there actually is for the efficacy of some approaches over others? Like, why does there seem to be a disagreement whether this difference exists at all? Uh, sometimes it's mentioned that the connection between therapist and patient pretty much predicts the outcome, but then you also often hear about CBT being better, at least in some contexts, or EMDR working for PTSD and, and so on. Yeah. Um, so let me be clear. I I find the common factors like intuitively as a clinician to be intuitively wrong. Uh, it doesn't, it, it certainly feels to me that certain psycho therapeutic modalities do work better. And that's in part because like, those are the ones that I would use. Right. And I I also think that there are exceptions to the Dodo bird verdict. I mean, I I think even they're not so clear empirically, they're not so clear. Um, But for example, exposure for uh, anxiety disorders, I think is an example of an exception, but, but nonetheless, it's still the case that there are still relatively few examples when you hit one psychedelic, or sorry, one psychotherapy versus another in head-to-head combat, there are not many examples of one clearly and consistently doing better than another. Um, and not only that, there are also, uh, a, 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 there's a history of psychedelic, sorry, I keep saying psychedelic therapy. There's a history of psychotherapies that were invented to use as sort of inactive control conditions um, that, that ended up being active. Um, I'm trying to think if I can remember an example of that. I think present centered psychotherapy is, uh, yeah, it's an example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do, do you know more similarly? There's more behavioral. The the, the right, right. Yes. Yes. Um, I can't, I can't, I was trying to pull up the notes I had, but. But yeah, I, I think it's just an empirical thing and it, it violates my intuition, certainly. And I, I don't necessarily obey it um, when I'm doing psychotherapy. I, I don't think you can. You have to have, that's part of the common factors, right? You have to have some sense that you know what you're doing and you have a method and it's plausible. And um, But at the same time, looking at this from an empirical angle, it's different. I, I am also curious if anyone like strongly disagrees with that too. Because that, that is often controversial. Yes, from the PTSD research, it does come to mind that you know, we find some, like you mentioned, some small differences, maybe um, favoring exposure or favoring trauma-focused therapies. But even then, they are very sort of minor and uh, not always found through all throughout all, all studies. Another question was on this Goodwin et al. paper on psilocybin therapy not being psychotherapy. You mentioned their comment about integration not being necessary and expressed your assumption that it would especially matter when it comes to longevity of the longevity of the effects. Could you uh, steal man a counter argument to this? So why might they disagree with this, this idea that integration is necessary for longevity? Uh, let me, before I st- try to steal man it, let me, let me just say one thing. Um, and that they, they are really appropriately, but they're really using this distinction of safety versus efficacy this is actually not a very clear distinction. If, if somebody is not safe, it's, it, there's an efficacy problem there too. And um, the COMPASS trial, the one that Goodwin is first author on, is the only trial that I'm aware of where you have um, suicidality in the group of people that are getting high dose psilocybin. So there's a safety, concerning safety problem there. There were like three instances of suicidal behavior in a, in a trial of treatment res- resistant depression and other, other trials have just not had that to my knowledge. And so that trial was notable for having pretty minimal integration. So you have next day integration after the dose and then one week later, and then it's done. All the suicidality occurred at the three week mark and on. So anyway, I, I just think that's worth mentioning because um, there, there's a very clear, even from their own data, 
safety argument that perhaps it's not enough integration. Um, but it's worth also thinking about like, well, is there a drug mechanism that could have led to people becoming suicidal three weeks later and on? Probably not, right? Probably what happens is that you have people that are dealing with a resistant depression. They've tried a bunch of things. They haven't worked. They have this drug experience. Oh my God. Yes. I got, I got the treatment. This is going to fix me. And then they're not better. And then these people that they've developed this like rather strong relationship with, they don't talk to again after a week. So not only are they not better, they demoralize. You also have this rupture of a therapeutic relationship, which is probably present, even if it's attempting to be minimized. And that leads to demoral. Th this is just my way of like imagining what might've happened, but this is what can happen if you sort of ignore that, like there's probably a psychotherapeutic dynamic going on um, and it would be appropriate only for safety, even if only for safety to include more integration. However, I've not answered your question. So steel men, why integration is not necessary. Is that the question? Oh, this is a fantastic, uh, like argue something you don't believe in, but uh, there's good arguments for it because um, there's no real proof, right? Strictly speaking, there's no real empirical evidence that you need integration at all for therapeutic effects. And you see therapeutic effects when people take psilocybin out in the wild. Um, the therapeutic effects are present uh, in many instances the next day or even immediately. So that's the steel man. Um, but ultimately it's just an empirical question. Like I could be wrong. Like maybe you don't need integration at all, but you should study that. Right. Another question is somewhat similar here is that you describe your disagreeing view on the perspective of Yaden uh, et al. in their article for using evidence-based psychotherapies or CBT, as they argued. How do you think they'd reply to the argument central to your disagreement? So well, um, what what are the central arguments for for um for the op opposing view here? So I, I mean I've talked to David Yaden about this a lot, and many of our conversations around this, we end up sort of realizing that we think more similarly than we realized. Um, and one of the ways that he would reply, though, which is different, is that you need something, right? You need something. If we're doing if if you're saying we're doing psychotherapy, then you need to do something that is evidence based and out there. And CBT is the most evidence based. And I kind of disagree with this because, uh, again, on the common factors thing, right? Um, and that's sort of a weaker version of this argument, though, that you just need something. I, I do think that we end up on the same page where like having something is important for reining in excesses um, to me. And he doesn't actually seem to think that this is a tool for, for like enhancing the efficacy of psychedelic therapy. It's more for, and this is where we kind of get into a bit of tricky territory when you're thinking about what is ideal in a research environment versus what might be ideal clinically. Um, and so I, I kind of hear him as talking more about what is best in a you know standardized research environment, which I don't disagree with. But ultimately, a lot of these, um, I think the field benefits from having people doing different things. So I'm also a little like skeptical that we need to standardize to such a degree that everybody's doing the same thing. Right. And once again, certainly a question that's waiting on um, comparative trials. Nobody has really done marrying the psychotherapeutic component. As a question from Raider Nervander, would you like to say it yourself? You open your mouth. I was thinking about, do you hear my voice, by the way? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking about, what's your opinion about psilocybin perhaps targeting like underlying transdiagnostical problems like chronic shame, pathological avoidance, internalizing problems, externalizing problems compared to more standardized manuals like focused more on symptom alleviation like sleep problems or or something similar um in short i th i agree i think that's probably what's happening that it is targeting transdiagnostic problems uh, people will 
come for trials with like very specific indications like smoking cessation. And sometimes they'll quit, sometimes they won't, but they'll, it's not infrequent. That they'll feel that they gain much more important things than stopping smoking, for example. Um, and they are the kinds of things that's, that are, they span trials, right? They span condition. There are themes, certainly. Um, but, but yeah, I do, I do think that fundamentally this is a transdiagnostic treatment. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Next questions from Bill Solomon too. Hey, um, yeah, um, it's it's um, actually interesting that there is not much evidence for the psychotherapy component of psychedelic uh, therapy. So, um, could you expand on on how to take account into account the ethical issues researching this the necessity or efficacy of psychotherapy in this context and um, and related, if you have any any thoughts on the usefulness or, or practicalities of, of doing this uh, in a naturalistic or underground setting, like randomizing participants for integration therapy, and and what 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 could a therapy look like? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess showing that the psychotherapy is necessary, the way to do that, I guess, would be to run a trial where there isn't psychotherapy at all. Um, so what would that look like? Maybe people show up for depression trial and you screen them. They don't have contraindications. You give them an informed consent document. It includes stuff that might happen in psilocybin. And then you give them a big dose of psilocybin and leave them in a room with a, with a camera. And if they're in distress, you just pop in and you give them a pill and, and the experience. Um, that that is what that might look like that's the how methodologically the research side and, and again there have been trials that have actually done something like that in the 50s um i think it's actually sort of important to do that because Again, like, like strictly speaking, empirically, we don't know that that's not going to work and be reasonably safe. Um, so I, I think that should be done. And I think that the ethical considerations can be mitigated by like aborting the experience at, with a very low threshold because you don't have that support there. I would not want to run that study and I would not want a family member to be in that study. Um, but I, I actually thinking about it abstractly, I, I think that like maybe the ethical quandary of it, it might be balanceable. Thoughts on the usefulness or practicalities of randomizing participants in underground settings. That is tricky. I don't know. I don't know if you could get something like that ethically approved. My guess would be no, but I, I would need to think about that more. It would be very useful. It would be very useful to do that. Um, and any way you can take advantage of the fact that people are already doing. Um, hmm, actually, I'm thinking about this now. I guess, I guess you could maybe randomize people to, I guess you could, in theory, do integration with people after they... I don't know. This is a complicated question, actually. Uh, maybe it's possible, but uh, it's tricky. And I, I don't have a clear answer off the top of my head. Okay. Thanks for your thoughts. Maybe follow up here, since you mentioned once before and now as well, like um, uh, ending problematic experiences with uh, risperidol or other sort of trip killers. Um, what do you think um, in, in, in current clinical use and maybe also reflecting on possible non-clinical contexts, um, where should the threshold be? When, when, when is that a good idea, actually? And have you had experiences in your trials where you actually used um, these drugs? Yeah. Um, let, let me first say that there is a bit of an ethos that if you are... So, so okay, there's no such thing as a bad trip, right? Uh, this idea that like anything challenging that happens, uh, ultimately there's something potentially good about it, psilocybin showing you what you need, etc. This is just not true for everybody, right? There is such thing as a bad trip. That's why we have the word. Um, I have given 
I'll give I'll give two examples. Um, one is a little unusual and not so generalizable, but uh, yeah. So there is an ethos where if you're administering a trip killer or a drug to aid with the distress, you have failed somehow, which I, I think is also very wrong. One example was somebody who syncopized. Uh, this person fainted. This was actually after. Uh, the bulk of the drugs had worn off and it was quite a good session. So um, somebody that had, it's, it's not entirely clear why this person fainted, but this is somebody that had a history of this. They weren't even like all that distressed prior to it happening. They fainted and believed that they'd had a seizure um, and sort of like was inconsolable and trying to leave, demanding to leave. And, you know, we exhausted our ability to, like, needed to go to the emergency room. And, and this person, like, was clinically like, doing fine, actually. And so we administered a benzo. And that was, I think, appropriate, helpful. Let me give a, a, a better example, though. So person in a trial of OCD who spontaneously described this as, like, a massive exposure. person had, had a lot of exposure therapy. Um, found the experience to be intolerably, it's actually the second experience, just intolerably scary, uh, anxiety provoking, uh, loss of control, all of that. And sort of finally asked, like, can you just give me something? I, I cannot take this anymore. And then this person had been suffering and trying things for like literally hours. And it was like, can you give me like something to end this? And it was like, well, yes, we can. Kind of brought it out, handed them, you know, got the, in this case, it was Valium. It was not a true trip killer. It was, uh, gave it to the person and, and the person kind of held it in their hand for a good 30 minutes. Never took it, but just sort of like considered like, oh, okay, there is actually an out. So it is really a choice I have to choose whether or not to engage with this experience or not. And that sort of helped the person realize like, okay, this is going to end. I, I, I can tolerate this and let me see if I can just get something out of this. And they ended up having like a full-blown mystical experience and all that stuff. Um, so it's a clinical decision. It's individual. There's, there is no way that you can give any clear guidance as to like when you should do it. It's, it's a clinical decision. Thanks. Yeah, a few more. Um anonymous questions here uh the association recently hosted a talk by ruben lokone on the topic of the relevance of insights for therapeutic outcomes so could you talk about that the role of insights in connection to the idea of, especially in connection to the idea of non-psychoactive psychedelics and if you wish also the risks related to insights that may lead to forming delusional beliefs um yeah i had some nice quotes on this that i cut out and I don't remember where I put them. Uh, oh, here we are. Basically, there's a, give me a second, actually. I think I might be able to find this. No, I can't. Anyway, there's this guy, Sidney Cohen. He was a LSD researcher in back in the day. And he, he became, I think, pretty skeptical of LSD research, but there are things that happen regularly, right? Like, for example, Stanislav Grof's uh, psychotherapy thing, his method. Um, there, there's some idea that like a lot of psychopathology is caused by like literal birth trauma, trauma that occurs when, as people are passing through the birth canal. Um, and many of his patients would have experiences of reliving their birth, which they experience in the memory. Um, and these would be sort of useful and positive. And I think this is kind of a, uh, oh, here it is. Here's a Sidney Cohen quote. Any explanation of the patient's problems, if firmly believed by both the therapist and the patient, constitutes insight or is as useful as insight. It is the faith, not the validity that counts. This is true, I think, for psychedelic therapy. This is also true for psychotherapy. So path life regression therapy, 
Um, this is a kind of psychotherapy which assumes the reality of reincarnation maintains that psychological distress is due to unresolved issues from people's past lives. I think according to the common factors, as long as both the patient and the therapist believe in the theory, have positive expectations regarding the treatment, and as long as the other common factors are present and it leads to behavior change, that is likely to be an effective therapy. So I think that the judge of whether or not this stuff is good or bad, it's probably going to be therapeutic. Um, and I, I think you need to have a different frame of understanding. I, I, don't, I don't think it's good for society, for example, for people to believe all kinds of um, non-scientific or, for example, anti-vax, whatever it might be. Um, but, but I think if you just look at this purely from like a one-on-one -on -one, um, patient therapist clinical encounter, and the therapist is not introducing their own ideas, but is rather being more non-directive, I think the ethics are kind of clear, actually, that like a lot of stuff that can happen is, is fine, as long as the patient is like consented. And so I don't know. I have lost sight of your question, I think, but I think insight is important. And I think that we need to have more of a societal ethical frame in looking at um, the kinds of belief changes that might happen as being problematic or not. The individual frame is actually not so clear um, there, though. Right. Another question here on, on a therapeutic approach. So one thing that MAPS's MDMA research has been criticized about is the ambiguity of the therapeutic approach as described in the manual. So it's been accused to allow, of allowing pretty much any approach. So uh, one might question the accept acceptability of too much improvisation when doing psychotherapy, especially psychedelic assisted, especially when it comes to talking about the results of the studies. This argument seems to be that if therapy is not properly delineated and described, it becomes impossible to compare it to other treatments. What do you think about this? So I think the MAPS manual, it does actually encourage like too many degrees of freedom. Um, it, it's, it's also kind of like weird stuff in there. And clearly, I mean, it seems to be effective, but um, I, I think that it, the manual doesn't actually restrain people from doing much. And in fact, in actively encourages people to do like all kinds of stuff that um, like, like, for example, we wouldn't like do. And this is a difficult question because I guess at Hopkins, right? Like we, there, we have like a culture of how to do psychedelic therapy where we would not be doing things like focused body work or helping people understand their past lives or um and so yeah i guess perhaps that should be better manualized for the for just like reining people in but hmm I don't know. It, it's, you're right. It's like a very difficult problem when you're dealing with a multi-site trial when you have like hundreds of thousands of therapists. It's, it's less of a problem when you have like highly trained people who are doing it in one site. Um, so, I, I mean, I think all trials are probably going to move towards having manuals. Um, but I, I think that like there's not been any fidelity rating of the MAPS stuff to my, maybe I'm wrong about that. So, I don't know. I think a lot of this ends up being window dressing uh, to look more rigorous. It's not necessarily the case that it's making research more rigorous, though. I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I apologize. It's a very important central question, though. So I, I wish my answer was better, but it, it's kind of tricky. Yeah. Yeah, certainly for me as well as a PTSD researcher re reading that manual. It, does, it is a little curious. It doesn't read necessarily like a manual for treating PTSD at least. It, it reads more like a manual for supporting positive MDMA experiences using whatever methods you um, you know. Uh, I'm tempted to ask here also, what do you think of, about the concept of inner healing intelligence that's mentioned so many times in that manual? Any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I have thoughts on that. I, I don't think that So it's, it, my understanding is that the concept of the inner healer comes from Stanislav Grof, 
And it's something that he sort of invented in doing LSD psychotherapy, I think. So I think that it is not something that my personal opinion is that I don't think we should be foisting this idea onto people because it's a little too directive. It's a little too woo woo. However, I do think that there is something useful about it, right? On the one hand, it does provide a rationale by which people can learn to try to accept and engage with what is happening Um, because it gives a mechanism of like, well, why could this be helpful? You have, there's this process, the inner healer. Um, and, And some people, they sort of view like what's being asked of them by the psychedelic experience to encounter suffering, which is frequent. To, to be like nonsensical, like I'm here to get better. Why would I do that? Right. So I think the concept of the inner healer, like it was invented for a reason, right? I think that it does encourage um, sort of trusting and accepting and all this stuff that seems to actually be helpful. I think there are other ways of doing that though. Yeah. Another question here. An interesting question from an anonymous attendee as well. Uh, to what, what extent do you think our society is prepared for the amount of weirdness that being in contact with psychedelics seems to facilitate and how could we prepare better? In general, there seems to be a broadening of the scope of things that people believe in after experiencing psychedelics. And of course, people tend to have uh, kinds of experiences that they never thought possible beforehand. It's a question also that I've thought about quite a bit. Yeah, is society ready for the amount of weirdness and what does that mean? Also, I sometimes think about Are we taking away too much of the weirdness in trying to um, standardize and uh, make psychedelics into medicines and so on? Are we disregarding the weirdness too much? So let me ask, answer the last part first. I, I don't like the medicalized use of psychedelics often gets sort of like targeted as being like people are using psychedelics, but are still mostly using psychedelics in every other way that's not medical. Right, all of this increase in psychedelic use. Remember, we're still talking about drugs that are illegal uh, outside of research context. Um, so, most of what is happening is not medical use, and I think medical use is a good frame, and it, we should continue to use it uh, in ways that make sense. I don't think we need to make it weirder. I think it's fine if people want to do all kinds of other things, but. We shouldn't change the frame too, too much. There are other ways that people can access psychedelics if they choose to or want to. Um, I lost the rest of the question. Uh, Your question before I changed it was, um, uh, is society ready for, for the amount of weirdness in terms of people starting to believe in all, believe in all kinds of things and, and just having really strange experiences that they didn't even think possible uh, with psychedelics? Yeah, this is kind of tricky because... On the one, I, I think that psychedelics do induce like non-materialistic belief changes. I, I, I think that's probably true. Um, the extent of that is not clear though, right? So when you're doing psychedelic, like it, it happens in the clinical trials. Um, it surely happens less than at ayahuasca retreats, both for the kinds of people who are going there, but also like the amount of like stuff that's getting thrown in your face. So I think it's a bit of an open question of like, how weird is it actually going to be? Um, I don't remember the latest numbers, but like we have a lot of people using psychedelics in the US now. Um, and I don't know, empirical question. I think we'll, we'll find out. Right. Another question continuing on the concept of the inner healing experience. In the MAPS manual, the inner healer is compared to how physical wounds naturally heal themselves, especially in the context supporting to healing, like cleaning the wounds and avoiding bacteria getting in. What do you think about this comparison? Useful or apt or what do you think? Uh, useful or not. I mean, it's clearly useful, right? Like they're using it for a reason. I, I, again, though, I, I do think that it's a bit overly directive or overly explanatory. Like there's a lot of things we just don't really know, right? Like sometimes people will describe their experience as happening in a way that, oh, this just sort of, what were, were that inner healing? I just in general, don't think we should be using language that like purports to really understand 
um, what is happening here when uh, we, we can we can easily introduce ideas into people's heads. It's not like a particularly noxious idea, but the ethos of like, we know what's happening and we're going to tell you what's happening. And it, it's just a bit much um, for me. Again, I don't think it's like super noxious, but, and I, I think in general, it's probably likely to be helpful. Like a lot of these weird ideas that people use. Um, but I, I personally would not use that. This one more question here from an anonymous attendee. Why do you think there isn't more research that directly compares different approaches to psychedelic assisted therapy? Of course, up to a certain point, there were very few studies overall, but now there are quite a few, but we still don't necessarily see any that would have compared um, different approaches. That is true. So I think it's worth looking backwards, um, like the psychedelic model, which almost everybody uses was but one of many, many, many different ways that psychedelics were administered in the 50s through 70s. And most of those just completely failed. And there was a lot, like there would be models where, you know, people were just strapped to a bed and given LSD. And there was models where like, but the thing is like, even though this was not empirically well shown, there was this kind of sense that like, oh, this actually works better if you use music and it works better if you have a supportive environment and it works better. So there's a model that was gleaned from back then and that's what seems to be working. So let's keep studying that. Who, who is going to be motivated to do the research that shows that, so one would be a drug company, right? Like if it is the case that you, I don't know, it, I guess the short answer to your question is like, people are going to do this. It's just, there's so much to do. Um, there's a group at um, Washington University that wants to do a minimal support uh, psilocybin depression trial, comparing it to the full complement. So that's the only one I'm aware of, but also under the hood, right? Like the compass study, for example, they're cutting it out, right? Now it's only two meetings before, two meetings after. Um, so, and look, there. that was an example where like, maybe they cut out too much, right? Like all of a sudden you have suicides, suicidality, not, not suicides. So it's sort of going to start happening, but there's just too much for everyone to do, I think. Right. Um, yeah, I'll give everybody a little bit more time if they do come up with some other other questions. Um, I would like to ask if you have do have some interesting cases or examples you mentioned that you could bring up uh, when you were talking about the enhancement of common factors like suggestibility or insights or this topic. Some that comes to mind from your your session, your clinical. Uh, I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. I didn't quite understand. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Um. If you do have some cases or case examples, when you were talking about the enhancement of common factors and suggestibility and, and these type of topics, something that stick, comes to your mind? Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, one example. So this is a person who had like actually not the most um, extreme, strong experience. Somebody who'd had the trial of psilocybin for major depressive disorder and had a lot of CBT in the year prior to coming to the study and sort of didn't quite get it right um so this is a person that has lots of negative self thoughts and during the it's important though that there was a lot of cbt that was being done to try to i don't know correct those negative self thoughts uh, so during the session, the person sort of had this visual experience of witnessing a funhouse mirror, like this mirror that sort of distorts um, one's perception of oneself. And this person had a very visceral sense that was able to step to the side of the mirror and look at the mirror, see that the mirror was still there. These negative thoughts were still there, but there was actually one like a, a action that he could do to disengage from it while still leaving them there, um, accepting that they're happening, but also felt like this has freed him up to experience himself in other ways. And as he did this, began to, it's like, oh, this is what all of my loved ones think of me. Felt this flood of love and warmth. Um, and, but also like, 
afterwards, right? After the drug was done, this was like one of the more important parts of the experience. And this person decided that this was like a thing that he wanted to practice doing. And so in his life, he began practicing this act of disengaging from the funhouse mirror, allowing these thoughts to be there, but also acknowledging that they're not necessarily him. This is the kind of stuff that you might see in CBT, but this person learned and practiced an emotional skill. That's psychotherapy, I think. So it's a version of it. And this happens in one degree or another in every single like, time this is done successfully. Um, people who get a lot of psychodynamic therapy, that, that can arise in interesting ways as well. But I think a, like a very basic, basic thing is that like, oh, oh yeah, another, another way like relational stuff can arise. Like people will often feel sort of not worthy or, um, and this comes up, especially in session where there's multiple doses. So people, uh, might, we're sitting there in the room with this person who's on a high dose of a drug for like hours, and we're not really doing much at all. And they, people can feel self-conscious. They can feel like maybe they wanted the volume a little lower, or they wanted another blanket, or they wanted to go to the bathroom, but we just went to the bathroom and that can raise feelings of like, I don't want to bother these people or I'm not good enough or, or they're probably unhappy with me. I'm not like having a good enough experience. And that stuff is important to work out because you want to make sure for the next session that they're comfortable, right? But the process of working that out of like trying to, like what, what were the barriers that you didn't feel like you could ask us to give you another blanket or all that, right? It, it raises, even just doing that, right? It raises lots of relational issues that often end up getting just kind of worked out. So I don't know if those were sufficient examples, but those are some of the things that come to mind. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear some of that clinical insights, clinical examples, and especially these seem to be related to um, uh, therapy that people have had before or, you know, experiences that they've had before that then then emerge here as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's um, all the questions we had had for now. So thank you very much, everyone, for for your questions and and Sandeep for your for your answers. And thank you very much for being here tonight. It's really a fascinating talk and, and really interesting to hear your thoughts on on this topic. And um, especially seeing as you've had this extensive clinical experience in, in addition to um, to the point of view of a researcher. Um, uh, yeah, um, thanks everyone for particip participating. I would like to remind you that we do have other webinars coming up. So we have David Dupois later this month and um, Charles Grupp uh, next month, I believe. And the uh, conference also coming up in, in November, where um, Max Wolf will be one of the, the keynotes mentioned today here and um, Manvir Singh. And we also have um, more than 20 other great speakers. Um, yeah, uh, before we finish, would you have some final words uh, that you'd like to say, Sandeep, to sum it all up? Mm, no, I'm, I'm out of words, but thank you so much for the invitation. It was really a pleasure to, to meet with you all and, and speak about this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Um, have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye.